Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming and welcome, and welcome to those who are joining us online. Um, my name is Graham Hunt. I'm the co-convener of the Sydney Central Branch of Renew, and uh, where, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the Indigenous leaders. We're in the land of the Wongan, Wongal people, part of the Eora Nation, and acknowledge their leaders, past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge the small footprint that they've been living in this country with for so long and in such a sustainable way. Um, so tonight we have a, an, a very interesting topic um, presented by my fellow co-convener, Mel Lupus. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to have her come and talk and share some of her experience. She's an accredited NATAS assessor who does home energy ratings for new homes. She's also an accredited passive house consultant and an accredited uh, energy efficiency scorecard assessor. So she has quite a lot of experience. And she, with, as a scorecard assessor, she assists people in improving the energy efficiency of their homes, their existing homes, and that's what she'll be talking about tonight. But as a NADA's assessor, she also helps people like me, architects, designers, and homeowners make their new homes um, more energy efficiency. So I'd like to hand over to Mel. Oh, I think I'm going to here. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Thanks, Graham. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming out here and being online, although I can't see you all online, but I assume you're there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, we also have a wonderful, uh, another presenter on after me, who's Sarah Aubrey, and she's fantastic, but you'll soon learn that. Um, so to start with, tonight we're going to speak about energy efficient retrofits and being in the inner west, um, we've got a lot of heritage houses in this area and, and while some people can just go and knock them down, other people like to keep what they've got and try and make the best of what they've got there. So, or for heritage reasons, they may not be able to knock anything down and we, we need to work with what we've got. Um, so I think Graham introduced me really well, so I'll just skip past that one. But if anyone needs to get in contact with me, uh, either through Renew or through my company, Sustainability Certified. So why do you want to retrofit your home for energy efficiency? I guess there's, there's a few reasons why different people might want to retrofit for energy efficiency. So one of them is to save money on your energy bills. Um, another would be to feel cosy in winter and nice and cool in summer. And... Others might like to reduce your carbon footprint, which is good for the planet and good for everybody else. Um, and other people may even want to just increase the value of their home to sell or to rent. Um, so some people, all of the above. So, and usually it all comes along for the ride anyway. So you may have one motivation, it might be environmental or to save money, but luckily everything, everybody benefits. So what's, and I purposely spelt that incorrectly, <laughs> what's using all the energy in your home? So this is just a typical Australian household. So it's not Sydney, it's not inner west, it is just a typical Australian household. So you can see a big chunk of that is space heating and cooling at 41%. And water heating, which a lot of people tend to forget, is 24%. Appliances, that includes all of your fridge, TV, video, computer, everything else. That's at another quarter. And then cooking, 6%, lighting, 4%. Now, another interesting, so, so this is sort of a general idea on what your energy is, is being used for in your home. So if you look at a state-by-state -state breakdown, this is quite interesting because I don't know if you can see it that well. Oh, you can. It's not too bad. So the colder states you can see, that space conditioning really, that chunk goes up a lot. So, and yes, they're using more because they're needing to heat for a, a lot longer than, than some of the warmer states. Um, 
So for New South Wales, where we are, space conditioning is only 27%, water heating is 28%, appliances 32%. But in general, that sort of this pie graph gives you a good idea of, of where we need to sort of focus, I guess. And you can see why space conditioning under NADERS has been such a big part of the NCC, looking at making sure that our thermal shell is really good so that we're not needing to run appliances to heat or cool our homes. So the good thing is for existing homes, we've had NADERS um, in the background and basics that is making sure that new homes are designed so that they're not use, having to use so much energy to heat or cool them. Um, but what's sort of been left out in the cold, literally, are the existing homes. And there will be 7 million existing homes that will still be standing in 2050 that have not been subjected to energy efficiency standards under the NCC. So, that's a big piece of the pie that we need to address if we want to get our greenhouse gas emissions under control. And the governments, are, to their credit, are really sort of jumping on this. Up until now, we haven't really had a really good software program to be able to scientifically say, in your home, we, we can put all the inputs in using a software program that then allows us to say, this is what on average your home will be using. This is how much is used by water heating, cooling, um, space heating, and yeah, or, or the, everything that's going on in your home. So is it the thermal shell that we need to focus on to fix or do we need to look at your water heater? Do we need to look at how old is your air conditioner? That sort of stuff. So now under residential efficiency scorecard, which was developed by the Victorian government, but has now been pushed out nationwide. You, there are assessors, assessors available for you to, uh, uh, I guess, engage to come out to your home and give you tailored advice. So it's government accredited program, Australia wide. The assessor numbers are growing. So that's a good thing. Hopefully we can reach all of the corners. Anybody who's interested in being an assessor, go on to the website is Home Scorecard. Anybody who's interested in getting an assessor to come out and give them an assessment, same website. Um, okay. So my husband, sorry, that's my husband and I, and we're assessors and look, we look like Steve Irwin going out to save the day. Um, okay, so the things that get assessed, as you can see, so in our software program that we've got, we're looking at the hot water system, what type it is, what year it is. We're looking at what the, the floor material and insulation is, heating system, warm materials insulation. If you've got pools or outdoor spas, we go around into every room and we measure up the room sizes and window sizes and put in the orientations of those because we're trying to get the full footprint of the home, as well as any, um, any solar coming into the room or, you know, I guess also letting the heat out from those windows if they're facing south, that sort of stuff. We look at the showers, we take um, a measurement of the showers to see what litre a minute they are using, because obviously that affects your energy use because that water needs to be heated, unless you all have cold showers. Um, then we, look, we get up into the ceiling space to look for ceiling insulation. If there isn't a subfloor, we're looking in under the floor for if there's any um, floor insulation. And we're looking at lighting primarily to see if you've got halogens and then the cooling system. So I think I covered everything there. Um, so it's, the residential scorecard system's a bit like we're all used to seeing that um, the energy rating on your appliances around the place. So it's kind of like that, but for a whole home. So it gives us a good indicator of how that home is performing. Um, it's the, the more stars, the cheaper the home is to run is, is the basic premise of it. So when you get a scorecard assessor to come into your home, you get a, a scorecard certificate that is generated out of the software. And Depending on the assessor, you also get a report from them. For us, we 
have quite a lengthy report, which we run through variations in that report of if you did this, changed out your hot water system, then you can expect to get a reduction of this amount. If you put in some insulation, you're going to get a reduction of this amount. So, yeah, depending on the assessors and, and how they run it, what they charge, that sort of stuff is the detail level of detail that you get. We also have a thermal camera and I know a lot of the other assessors do as well. So that kind of allows us to see a few things which I'll, I'll allude to a little bit later on. So the, the scorecard certificate has two sort of parts to it. And this is, it gives you a hot weather comfort rating. And this uh, indicates how easy it is, it is to keep your home cool in hot weather without using any, um, uh, any cooling. And then you get a cold weather comfort rating. And this is in bars here. Now the, the two things, um, sorry, the, the thermal comfort rating, and then you get an appliance efficiency rating as well. And so that's looking at, okay, when we go back to the office, we, we type in all the um, model numbers of the air conditioning systems and the hot water systems, that sort of stuff, so that we can get a, a star rating on those. And then that gives us a, a good indicator on how efficient they are and whether they should be maybe looked at for replacement, depending on their age, that sort of stuff. Um, and so you get the appliance efficiency rating as well. The two combined give you the overall star rating. Now, it's also worth noting that you, down here, you can see that it gives you the star rating of the home without solar. So Unfortunately, if you put a one kilowatt system on a tent, you know, that could really um, increase your star rating because PV is PV, right? But it's sort of got this added check and balance in that, that this is your, your real star rating without PV. So you've got to look at both and understand. And also going back to that thermal comfort rating, you need to be looking at that because that's really showing you the shell of the building so that's more equivalent to your natas rating that you'll get for a new build currently okay sorry just go down so now i'm just going to talk through some of the things that we include in our report so and and some of the things that we've found in our assessments over the last you know year or so so gaps cracks and gaping holes <laughs> So you'll be surprised at how many, uh, you probably walk past them every day, but when you get somebody in your house and they go, what about that? What about that? What about that? And you have to kind of understand also that if an assessor does come to your home, we're not judging you at all. We're trying to help you find those things that need to be fixed. Um, you don't need to get an assessor. You could go around and do this yourself. Um, so these are the places you need to look, under doors, around skirting boards, ceiling vents, around window frames, wall vents and floorboard gaps. So they're pretty, you know, standard things that you would think, but you've probably been looking at these things forever and a day and not even realised that there's a lot of heat going out there. So here are some of the solutions. Um, you've got caulking. So this is my idea over the side there is I often tell clients, what about you have a cocktails and caulking party and give um, each of them your party members, a cocktail and a corking gun and say, right, you're onto this room, go and fix it up. Because cork, there's no fun in corking. It's laborious and it's just got to happen, I guess, if you want to draft proof your house. So maybe try and make it into a fun event. Um, and then there's some other products here in terms of window stripping and door stripping. There's some really good videos online that tell you how to even put these things in and how to um, do the caulking. So uh, the resources are all there, okay, to make it easier. This is um, one of my pet peeves, I guess. <laughs> we see this all the time. Um, so these are unsealed exhaust fans. You probably walk past them all the time, not realising that many of them, not all of them, many of them, uh, actually like that. They're just exhausting straight up into the roof space, which is not great, putting a whole heap of moisture up into your roof space. Best idea, I'll, I'll go that on to the next slide. Then, then you see here, if you've got a wind-powered roof ventilator, so what it's doing in the middle of winter when the wind's blowing, it's pulling all of the beautiful warm air out of your house, up through these, straight out there, 
And there you go, there's your freezing lady over there. So we do see that one quite a lot. It's an easy fix, it's not ex expensive at all. Somebody's running the heater in there, it's just going straight out there. Um, if you can replace your unsealed exhaust fans with uh, self-sealing ones, often what we find is these little guys, they're self-perpetuating in the way that you have to have these heat lamps because it's so freezing because the air's going straight up into the roof space. So often you might find that if you replace them just with a sealed um, exhaust fan, you may not need to have any heat lamps at all. Um, the draft stoppers you can't use if you've got a heating um, element into that exhaust fan, but they're a good solution for this sort of thing. Uh, they go over this. Better solution would be to get it exhausted outside of the outside of out to the outside of the house. Yeah, instead of going to the roof space. So you can also swap the wind-driven one with a humidity and temperature-controlled roof ventilators that are out on the market. So. Um, yeah, there's plenty of things. There's lots of products out there. You've just got to either get somebody who knows all about them or get on Google, start looking. Um, I'm just going to see if I can run this video. This is interesting. Won't be a second. Okay, this is just a good indicator showing you. So this is my, oh, it's not going to show. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> it's not showing on the screen, but... Halogens are triple whammy of energy inefficiency. They leak air into the roof space. They use a lot more energy than an LED. And they also cause these gaps in the ceiling insulation because they run hot. We can't have the insulation around them within the vicinity of them. So they're triple whammy. Oh, wrong. Oops. Oh. Yeah, okay. I think because I hit play. Sorry, told you, technical. Uh, here we go. No, it's right here. Resume slides. Go there. Okay. Oh, there you go. It did go. You can see that incense sticks are great for finding air leaks around the house. Um, you just kind of go around all those gaps and cracked places and you can see the, the movement on the incense stick. Um, one solution for that problem with the halogens is to ICF or IC4 um, downlights, if you want to put those in, LEDs, and they can be completely covered and abutted with insulation. They have to have that mark on them, though, otherwise you can't do it. Um, or surface-mounted lights, pretty simple. And then if we look at insulation, another really easy one. If you can, the, the gaps, a 5% gap is equivalent to a 50% loss in, in insulative value. So if you've got an R4 in the ceiling, you've got an R2 just by having that gap. So it's a waste of money and a waste of heat. So when we go around with our thermal camera, really easy to see these big gaps around light fittings and just around the place. Sometimes insulation's been moved by contractors up there. So Good idea to get up there and make sure it's all nicely put in. You can put um, ceiling insulation in, underfloor insulation, and then walls. You can see those sort of heat losses that you're getting in winter. Um, obviously, prioritise the ceiling. And uh, underfloor is pretty easy to do as long as you've got a bit of access. And windows in winter. So there's a few options for windows. You can add films. You can use magnetite. You've probably all heard of magnetite. Um, and you could get them refurbished so they're not so leaky. Double hung windows, which are often, or sash windows, whatever you want to call them, often found in, in the inner west, um, can be particularly leaky. If you get them refurbished and um, they add little seals in there, get rid of the leaks, stop that sort of flow. Um, you can replace with double glazing. It's very expensive. Um, for retrofitting. So maybe in terms of when to do it, maybe look at the other things first. And then in, if you add really good window coverings, which are heavy drapes and pelmet is number one, but honeycomb blinds are really good. I don't know if you've seen what honeycomb blinds are, but you can see a picture there. They add a really good insulative 
layer to your window. And, and if you get really good window coverings, you're looking at equivalent insulative value as double as you know some double glazing. Okay. But you've got to remember to close them at night. So they're wonderful to have them there. If you don't close them, they're not doing anything for you. Okay. In summertime, we're mainly looking to shade our east and our west windows. And that's you need some sort of vertical shade for that because you, as you know, the sun's coming in at that really low angle at that time. And that's when particularly west windows in the afternoon and that's really coming in hot by the time you're sort of getting to that five o'clock, six o'clock, it's just about to set. Um, so you really need something that drops down. It's no use having anything that's going out horizontal. So, okay. Space heating. So there's obviously a lot of different space heaters on the market. Um, interestingly, these ones here, so these are all sort of a, a resistive element. And then we've got wood burners, gas heaters, and then I've got a ducted system over there and a split system. So we see all these things and, and you put them all into the software and that helps us determine our recommendations, I guess. So with electric resistive heating, I don't know if anyone here has heard of coefficient of performance. So basically, if you put one kilowatt of hour of energy into that appliance, you're going to get equivalent of about one kilowatt of heat out. So basic principle. When you're dealing with an air conditioner or some people call it a heat pump, for the one kilowatt of energy that you put into it, you're getting between four and six kilowatts of heat out. And that's because it's using a refrigeration uh, in the condenser outside. And in terms of the best, the most efficient heating and cooling, it's air conditioners by, by far. Um, split systems are more efficient than ducted systems because there's always some losses associated with the ducting. Um, and then this is a pretty simple one, set the thermostat at 18 to 20 degrees. Every degree higher will increase the cost of heating by about 10%. There's the Energy Star rating site that you can go to. Um, don't just go out and buy an air conditioner or take the advice just from the air conditioning guy. Go and do some research yourself, get yourself empowered with that knowledge and then have that conversation with them. Same thing for space cooling. Fans are fantastic. Ha <laughs> um, Really, really good way, very energy efficient way to cool off. And don't forget to use your fans in conjunction with your air conditioner because you're then, you can then reduce the amount of um, air conditioning that you need because you're getting the fan as well. So double up. Hot water heaters. Um, again, we're back to this system here with the heat. I mean, have you, has everyone heard of a hot water heat pump? It gets bandied around a lot. Same situation as the air conditioner. Um, coefficient of performance is a lot higher than your electric resistive storage heater. Um, so solar. Fantastic. You've also got evacuated tube solar. That's the most efficient. Uh, new guy on the block is the PV diverter. And that's where you're utilising the PV that you've got on your photovoltaics you've got on your roof to push down, use your hot water sort of as a battery. So if you've got enough, you're making enough that your house is already covered, then it'll push it next to the hot water heater and then out to the grid. So you're getting to use more on site. Um, eight litres or less a minute on your, on your shower heads is, is a, good, um, a good spot to aim for. You can go less. I don't like to recommend it in case people are really uncomfortable. Would recommend that you get a quality one um, that, that is going to, there's a big difference between an eight litre a minute, a really cheap and nasty and a decent one. The, the quality of the shower that you're going to get, two different things. And ask friends about that sort of stuff. I'll come to that. I'm jumping ahead. Sorry. Solar. Um, we've had some really good Renew webinars on solar. So they're already saved up on our Renew YouTube channel, the do's and don'ts when purchasing a residential solar PV system. And the good thing about Renew is it's unbiased information. So 
any of our sort of uh, YouTube channel webinars, you're going to get a lot of good info. And then the other one was energy storage time to add batteries. And that one was from Melbourne's um, chapter. That's a big space. You probably already know a fair bit about that space, um, but happy to answer any questions after. I'm not the expert in solar, <laughs> but uh, you know, I know I know enough. Um, so what upgrades will give you the best bang for your buck? Draft proofing is really cheap. Corking gun might cost you a little bit in cocktail ingredients, but otherwise, off you go. Uh, low flow shower heads, you, not a very expensive one, yet saves you. I mean, we've been in houses where you, uh, you know, 28 litres a minute, um, should be eight litres a minute. So those people were really happy to learn that, you know, you don't really comprehend that you, you just kind of have your shower every day, don't really realise how much it's using. Uh, ceiling fans, like we talked about, solar PV, always, if you haven't got it, it's always a good uh, one for reducing your energy, on-site energy, oh, sorry, from pulling into the grid, from the grid. And then efficient hot water systems, efficient heating and cooling, insulation, and window coverings. And then how do you choose a provider? Now, Sarah's going to have lots of info about our inner west area, but get on the Renew website. Subscribe to Renew. There's always information about particular products. So if you don't know Renew, it's like Choice Magazine for sustainable products and often has lots of buyer's guides in that. So for heat pumps or air conditioning, it, it goes through the different heating types and explains all that. So it's really good resource. And then Sanctuary is like your home beautiful of the sustainable world. Gorgeous designs in there. They talk through the actual design of the home. A, a lot of those are renovations as well. And then the star ratings and all that sort of stuff. So you can get a good idea on... Um, architects that they've used and, and builders and that sort of, so that's all written up in there um, in the magazine. Contact the Inner West Community Energy and we've got Gavin here tonight. They are a great resource for putting you in touch with local people that can provide solar or insulation. They're good recommendations. Um, ask your friends and family if they've had a good experience, if they've had a bad experience, great, don't go to those people. So you'll be surprised once you've kind of got in your head that you're going to do this, then so many people are ready to talk about what they've done or, you know, who they've used. Um, and then other one was to go on my Energy Efficient Electric Home Facebook page, um, which was started up by Tim Forster, who's fantastic. And lots of information there. I think there's like 80,000 people on that. So good information sharing there. Okay. And then now we're going to do... Sarah Aubrey's presentation. So bear with me with the technical side Why we play her presentation and then we'll have Q&A after that. So. Hello everyone and welcome to my energy efficiency retrofit story. My name is Sarah and I live in St. Peter's in the inner west of Sydney. And just before I start, I just wanted to say that I am aware of how privileged I am to have had the money to do this. Um, not everyone is in the same position and hopefully one day everyone will be able to have a house which is energy efficient and also comfortable because everyone I think deserves cheap energy and a comfortable house to live in. So I just wanted to preface with that. So this is my 115 year old house. It is double brick. It is um, when Mel came and assessed it, it had ducted air conditioning and uh, we had one very old wall split uh, which is about 20 years old. Um, we had gas hot water, a gas stove and an unflued gas heater and we have floorboards throughout the house, no carpet, just rugs, um, a slate roof which is slightly problematic when it comes to um, solar and we had old blow-in insulation in the roof which was okay but it wasn't really doing the job and we didn't have any underfloor insulation. So why did I want to do a retrofit? Well, the house was freezing in winter and I work from home. So I was spending a lot of time at home and I, I can't even begin to tell you how, I mean, there was very little difference between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. Um, 
And so when you turn the ducted air conditioning on, the house would just not retain the heat. You know, after the heating the house, you know, you turn the ducted air con off and it will be cold again in 20 minutes. And I just thought this is this is not right. It shouldn't, you know, it should be holding on to that heat. You spend all this money heating the house and then it's just gone. And so I also wanted to make the house more resilient to more extreme weather with climate change. I just thought winters are going to get colder. We're going to have hotter summers. You know, I need to the house needs to be ready for the next 115 years. And also to avoid future bill shock because we were using huge amounts of electricity in winter. Like we were using over 41 kilowatt hours a day. And I'll sort of explain how much electricity that really is, which is just off the charts. I mean, that's on top of having gas in the house. Also, we had um, we had a, an unflued gas heater. So the air quality from the unflued gas heater, it was actually making us quite sick. Um, dizziness. Um, headaches, you know, we just knew it wasn't, it wasn't right. It wasn't making us feel good. You know, I mean, it's not healthy. And I also listened to the book by Saul Griffiths called The Big Switch, which you can actually listen to the audiobook for free if you go to um, Rewiring Australia. Um, and he said in that book, it was just as effective to electrify your house and get off gas than it was to buy an electric car. And I thought, well, you know, I'm working from home now. I'm not driving as much. Um, in fact, probably about a, a quarter of what I used to drive. So I think decarbonizing the house and making it electric would be a better use of the money that I had saved towards an electric car. All right, so the big thing was where to start. Um, anyone wanting to do this, I'd highly recommend joining the Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home, because it's a massive resource. There's over 75,000 people in the group. They've all done this before. If you have a question, it will have been asked before. People have fantastic answering questions. Um, also, I would recommend joining the Inner West Community Energy Group, which is a brilliant resource and volunteer group in our area. So again, fantastic for finding tradies. They'll help you with your solar. They helped me find a solar installer. They helped me um, with an installer of our heat pump as well. Brilliant. So fantastic. Can't recommend it enough. And the biggest thing that I would recommend, of course, is to get your house assessed by a residential efficiency scorecard assessor. AKA Melancholy, because um, I I couldn't have gotten the results I got without getting the house assessed. Because Mel's report was so comprehensive, I used it as my bible, you know, the checklist of going through all the things that I needed to do. And she found things that I had no, I thought I'd done lots of things, and nope, there was still lots of stuff to do. So, highly recommend doing that. So before being assessed, um, we had done just a handful of things in the house over the years. We had done a bit of low hanging fruit, like replacing our halogen downlights with LED energy efficient IC4 rated downlights. So an IC4 rated downlight, uh, they don't get hot, means you can cover them with insulation, whereas halogen downlights, they get hot and you, you can't actually cover them with insulation, which means you have holes in all your insulation in the roof. And they also use a lot of electricity. Um, and we also had upgraded our glass. That's not necessarily a thing that everyone would need to do, but we live very close to the airport. So we did it for noise and thermally. Um, so they actually take the windows off and keep the beautiful sash wood windows. They take the glass out and they put in a, a double laminate glass. That makes the window heavier, so they put new weights in. And what they did at the same time is they mitered around uh, all the windows and some of the doors and put in these fabulous um, draft proofing brushes. So now when you open our window, it goes shh instead of <laughs> So um, that actually was a, a, a great thing that we did. And we also, before Mel had come, we had installed a small, very small, too small, uh, 1.7 kilowatt solar array. All right. <clears throat> so the first assessment <laughs> kind of made sense that the reason the house was freezing was because it was only 2.9 stars out of 10. So not very good. I think, um, I think that made a lot of sense to me. And the solar actually bumped us up to 5.5 stars out of 10, but 
it was crap. I'm going to go with the 2.9 stars because that's really what it was. All right. Whoops. Hang on. So your mission, sorry, I'm going to come back here. So this is what the scorecard from Mel looks like, and she gives you a very comprehensive report. Um, as you can see, 2.9 stars, and then she gives a, a, a cold weather comfort rating, um, a hot weather comfort rating, and then gives you all these different things that you can do with the house. So it's brilliant. So your mission, should you choose to accept it, being the kind of competitive person I am, I was like, right, okay, this is what I have to do. Uh, Mel gave us some short-term plans and some long-term plans. So the short-term priority, she said, were to top up the ceiling insulation, to seal all the gaps and cracks in the house, and to install chimney stoppers, because they were. You'll see. I'll show you. Um, and then longer-term upgrade options were to replace the gas stove with induction, upgrade our ducted air conditioning to energy efficient wall splits, increase the size of our solar array, uh, replace the gas hot water with a hot water heat pump, and upgrade some of our window coverings, underfloor insulation, and replace the range hood and make sure it's ducted to outside. So. The big question with that for me was what order do I do things? Because even though probably one of the biggest results you'll get and, you know, bang for your buck is to upgrade your ceiling insulation. But because we had blow in, I was like, uh, if I do that and then I have tradies going in and out doing other things, it's just going to be a nightmare and, and, you know, be a complete mess up there. So I thought I'm going to sort of try and do all these other things and then leave the roof insulation to last so it's undisturbed. So you've got to think about what order you do things in to not kind of undo or ruin things that you've already done. And one big thing that I learned is that if you have just a 5% gap in your insulation, it's a 50% loss in efficiency. I mean, that's just off the charts. 5% gap, 50% loss. So can you imagine if you just have all those halogen lights in your house, well, that's probably 5% right there. So, you know, you have to make sure everything up there is just like tight, tickety-boo. So the first thing that I actually did was the range hood because our range hood was 25 years old, didn't work, and it was just ducted to the top of the cupboard. So useful. And uh, Mel mentioned this, but also uh, there was a Renew talk that I, I the four week thing that they did. And one of the architects mentioned, you need to, if you're going to close all the gaps and cracks in your house, then you need to make sure you're ducting all those things like cooking smells out of the house, which I hadn't sort of really considered. <clears throat> and the reason I did that first is because I didn't really want to do the stove and a tradie would drop, you know, a hammer or something on a lovely glass brand new induction stove. So I thought I'll just get that done first to avoid any damage to my induction stove. So the next thing that I did was the stove because that was the only gas appliance because it was October when I was doing this. Um, I wasn't obviously using the unfluid gas heater at that time of year. I thought, well, that's the only thing that's actually inside the house that's gas. But if we get rid of that, we can start filling, filling in all those gaps and cracks. You can't do that if you've got gas appliances inside the house. It's too dangerous. So when you install a stove, um, you need a plumber and an electrician because you need the plumber to disconnect the gas and cap it and remove the stove. And you need an electrician because they need to run a separate circuit from your board to that stove. So that's an, an added expense that you need to consider when you install an induction stove. You need to check you've got space on your board for it and the cost. So it's about a thousand bucks for us to do it. Um, and you also need to make sure that if your stone bench top is a stone bench top that the size of your new induction stove fits because I discovered that even though they were both Bosch and I had looked at the measurements and specifications of each, the lovely surprise of discovering that they had cut it, cut it to 49 centimetres for the gas stove, even though it's 49 to 50 centimetres and the new thing was 50 centimetres. So I had to find someone who was a stone cutter who did wet cutting, who would come to the house on the day that the electrician was coming to come and actually cut that one centimetre off. So there's always these things and that leads me to unexpected surprises, which that was my first unexpected surprise. 
All right, so this is my board. So this was the other unexpected surprise was that, as you can see in the left-hand photograph, I mean, that meter is probably older than me, but the, <laughs> the board probably isn't much um, as well in terms of age. So it's a real mess. It's already full. It's just, they were like, eh, we need to add a circuit for the induction because I wanted to do wall splits, we needed two more circuits for that. So it was just like, it was just like easier just to replace the actual board. So that was an added expense and again, a bit of a surprise. So you need to factor these things in. <clears throat> and you can also see that they've actually added a, um, a new meter as well, which is you can't have your old meter if you want solar. All right, so I made the decision. I thought I'm going to get rid of the ducted aircon. And I did that for a few reasons. Um, one was that it was 15 years old. We had had the motor repaired already. We had had the ducting repaired already. So it really kept it going. But every time um, we had an air conditioned person round to service it, I was like, how long does this actually last? He said, oh, 12 to 15 years. Um, and it just didn't work properly. It was incredibly inefficient. It used so much electricity. And the hallway was really warm but the lounge room was really cold. So it's just like, it's time to go. Also, the vents in the floor were just a big hole, you know, the holes in the floor, it's a big heat loss. So you warm up the house and then all this cold air is coming up from under the house and you're just losing all that heat that way. And it also limited us because of the massive ducting under the house, doing anything under there, every tradie that went under there would just squash it and you just couldn't get around. And it meant that we couldn't do the underfloor insulation if we had that ducting under there because you just wouldn't physically be able to do it. So I made the decision to pull it out and put in uh, new wall splits. So these are Dakin Cora wall splits. Um, you can see my aircon guy did a fabulous job. Um, so we have four of those, uh, one in the lounge, one in and one in each sorry, what two, you know, the rooms that we work in and then the back of the house. So brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And yes, I did a spreadsheet because <laughs> I've clearly got too much time on my hands. Um, but I found it really, well, I, the reason I did a, a spreadsheet is because they all have their energy ratings, like star ratings and all that sort of thing on their websites. But they all kind of show it differently. So I just wanted to put it all together. So that EER and the COP are the heating and cooling energy ratings, essentially. So the higher, the better. And I, and I also wanted to look at things like the decibels. How noisy is it inside? How noisy is it outside for my neighbours? And if I put it all in one place, I was able to kind of go, cool. That, and then the actual physical size of the unit. Um, so I highly recommend doing something like that if you have the time. Um, so I actually opted for the Cora. The Alira X was actually slightly more efficient and has a um, an air purifier in it, but it was the size of it on the wall. Anyway, it's brilliant. I'm so happy with it. So the next thing, because I had removed gas from the house, uh, was to do draft proofing. So here comes the fun part. So Mel identified... So this is the old kitchen hearth in our, we still have the old, you know, what would have been the original stove area in the house. And you can see there's just this metal plate over the, um, the top there and there's a gap at the front of it. So even though all our chimneys have been cut off um, and just go into the roof, that's still just cold air coming into the house and you're losing your hot, your hot, your heat through there as well. So I went to the foam booth and I got some high density foam, which I just measured it, got it cut to size and pulled out the plate and put that in there and there you go. Another thing Mel identified was that the fireplace in our lounge room was actually open and I had no idea. Been in the house 12 and a half years, had no idea. A rat could have fallen down there at any moment and I wouldn't have had a clue. <laughs> so I was so horrified to discover that. That's probably also why we didn't die from the unfluid gas heater in retrospect. Um, so yes, she identified that and again put in the foam. And this is what I did with the decorative vents in the house. So I'm halfway through doing this in the photo and I actually used a high flexible filler, get out your corking gun and go nuts. And I actually used, you can, you can have ones that go on clear, um, white and then dry clear, but I actually used a black one because I just thought when you actually kind of just sort of glance, it, it looks like it's still open. So I quite liked that. And that actually was really handy to use throughout the rest of the house, which I'll show you as well. So when Mel put her thermal camera over that when she came back, it was it was great. It works a treat. 
So these are things that Mel identified actually. Um, for example, you wouldn't necessarily know. So that left-hand photograph is actually above my kitchen door. So it's the frame against the wall. So there's a big gap there and cold air coming in through there, had no idea. So that's when she goes around with the camera and identifies things like that. And you know, that photo on the right is actually the fireplace. So you can actually see down under the house. <laughs> Yeah, the gap there. So again, that's where I use that black filler because it was really, you just wouldn't really notice it and you can go through and just fill it all. Um, again, she identified along all the skirting boards um, that I use the filler that goes on white and dries clear. And I use the black filler on that right hand photo because that's by our back door. And actually you can see water has come underneath that door and damaged those boards. So the next, I'll show you in the next photo, but to stop that shows that basically it's not weatherproofed um so that's my dog bindi um mel recommended putting these rp3 raven uh, weather strips down so <clears throat> they're basically on a little sort of hinge and when you shut the door it goes like this and there's a little rubber thing and it pushes against that and flips down so it goes when you shut the door so it's got this great rubber along the bottom and it is well and truly well and truly weatherproof so now no water comes underneath that that other door from the photo i showed you which is brilliant so the next thing to do was deal with the headache of the all these giant holes in our floor with the vents so some of the rooms i got those reclaimed boards which had all the um the varnish on them already so no sanding required and then we actually had to replace some boards with new boards in our sunroom because that's where the return was for our air conditioner. So it's amazing what you can fit in a Fiat 500. As you can see, that is kind of, you know, it's all right. Uh, that's basically what we did, patched the floors like that. That's actually a hatch just above it. So that those lines wouldn't have been there before, but I think it looks pretty good. Um, and in this next photo you can see it was a bit of a headache in this room so that where that big hole is is where the return for the ducted air conditioning was and we actually managed to salvage those boards just to the right of him um, to use throughout the rest of the house so that was great then we sanded the room and that's basically how it ended up so because we had done that that meant the next thing we could do was underfloor insulation yay so um this was what i was most excited about because you could just feel the cold coming up which we do in all our houses in the inner west so you can i've just used this photo so you can sort of see the thickness of the insulation they use on big rolls um, and here's just another example of that and you can see we had the hatches so when you have hatches in the floor they do this wonderful thing where they staple around it and also make that nice and weatherproof and thermally fabulous. So here's an example of what the underfloor insulation looks like. So you can see that they go over the top of pipes and over the top of all the joists and they go between the bearers. So they just stay, go through and they just, sorry, staple it in. And um, yeah, it was just a few hours and they were done. So it's pretty magical stuff. And just here's another example. At the front of the house, you can see there's not actually a huge um, gap so they, I think at the front even at one point it gets to about 40 centimeters but they got in there so you know I mean if it's that you wouldn't be able to do it but if it's you know you can, you can do it and that's made a massive massive difference to the house so the only thing remaining of gas was the heat pump the hot water so I just thought look I could have left it and waited for it to die but it's sort of speaking with inner west community energy it was interesting um and the the installer it, it did take a few weeks to get the tank and the air conditioning unit the inverter and i just thought if that dies if the it was already 12 years old that um gas and i just thought if that dies you want it fixed straight away i don't want to put gas in again i also don't want to be paying that daily surcharge i also just don't want to be using a dirty fossil fuel if I don't need to, I just thought, no, nah, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So that tank, I will just quickly say um, that heat, that actual whole heat pump unit is probably a bit of a Rolls Royce of heat pumps. Um, the two sort of in the My Efficient Electric Home Group best sort of inverters are by Sand and, and Reclaim. Um, 
and that tank is made here in Australia. So it costs probably more, you know, you can probably get a heat pump half the price of that. But I opted for that because they're a, a cooperative that it's in the Latrobe Valley and they get old uh, people used to work at in the, the coal plant that, there to work in this manufacturing. I'm just explaining that very badly. But basically it's transitioning workers from fossil fuel coal power plant to um, renewable energy and manufacturing in Australia. And I was just like, man, I am so all for that. Supporting Australian workers, let's do it, help them move. So that's why I got that. So it's actually a stainless steel tank wrapped in um, recycled plastic and it's just brilliant. So I'm all for that. So once we did that, we were able on exactly the same day to do this. So that is our gas meter and I will say goodbye to you kind sir. So yes, that was very, um, that was a moment that was very satisfying. And if you want to ask me about the process of dealing with that <laughs> and dealing with Gemini, it was pretty funny. So I'm happy, happy to talk about it. <clears throat> All right. So before I did the final, you know, roof insulation top up, I was like, what else can I do now uh, before I do that? So I don't disturb it. Um, in our bedroom, we'd actually don't have any um, heating or any, never have in our bedroom, but we would in summer use a floor standing um, fan. So I thought, well, why don't we just put a ceiling fan in because it's really like unbelievably energy efficient, a ceiling fan. I, and I, do you know what? I actually think it's my favorite thing that I put in the house. It's just, it's the best. And you can't hear it. It's fabulous. I love it so much. Can't wait till summer. So did that. And then also one of Mel's suggestions was to bump up our solar, which we have now bumped it up from 1.7 kilowatts to 4.7. So uh, stoked about that. So as you can see, it's not on the slate. It's only on the tin roof, unfortunately. Um, and that's a very small system still compared to a lot of people, but brilliant for us. We're just a household of two people and a dog. All right, and just one of the other things that Mel suggested was to improve our wall coverings. So on that left-hand photo, that's honeycomb blinds, and it's like a concertina, um, you know, with a... Um, so it creates this lovely thermal break. So, and these are really good because they open from the top and bottom, so they're fabulous for privacy. We got some of those put in. We just got the just the regular one on a pulley in the back of the house, which Mel recommended. And then she also recommended invisible pelmets. Who knew that helmets that pelmets were coming back in fashion? But they are because they're brilliant and they stop the cold air from coming up behind your curtains. And so Mel recommended invisible ones for us. So um, it's just basically perspex that sits over the top there and stops that cold air. So the piste de resistance. Here we go roof insulation. So this was the roof before, um, before. So Mel has circled that because that is actually our skylight in our bathroom. And our bathroom was always so cold, <laughs> like colder than any other room in the house. And the reason for that, there's two reasons. This was one of the reasons was that when my builder put in that skylight, he did not wrap that skylight in insulation. So Mel recommended that. So it was just a big chimney essentially in the bathroom. And the other thing was that when we pulled the ceiling down and put a new ceiling in, obviously he put in um, bats, but ran out. And you can see that there's just whole gaps missing in the roof there in our bathroom. So that's why it was so cold. And also they'd been pulled up and messed around by the electricians. So you've got to go up and check these things if you've got someone up there doing work in your roof to make sure they put things back where they should be. So, ready? Um, the ceiling insulation after, so look at it, isn't it beautiful? You can see that the skylight is wrapped and just the snowy wasteland that is my ceiling. Look, let's look at another angle because it's just so nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. It's, you go up there and it's like this. It's just fab. Um, so I've actually put in some little goat pads up there now with a drill down some little wooden parts so that because there are you can still walk on the um, bearers but all the joists are covered so put these little parts in so the termite guy can go up and still do inspections but man that has made such a difference mel was up there doing her assessment and it was like i think it was like 50 degrees in the roof and it was still like 23 degrees in the house it was just crazy 
And because we all, every time we opened our hatch, we would just always get this loose insulation falling down. They put bats around the outside of the hatch. But also Mel identified that there was no insulation on top of the hatch. So it was just this big hole in our insulation because hello, hatch. So they put um, bats on top of that hatch as well. So now that's thermally fabulous. All right, tips. Here are my tips. Pick the right tradie. So if you're after a tradie, ask in groups like My Efficient Electric Home or ask in West Community Energy. And before you start, explain to the tradie what you're trying to do with draft proofing and removing gas. And if they don't get it, just move on and hire someone else. Um, because, oh look, I'll tell you, the, the, that first job I did with the, um, with the range hood, I prefaced it with what I was trying to do. I said, I oh, can't leave any gaps, any, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they cut a very lovely hole on the outside of the house, nice and square and, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, and then they took bricks out from behind my, they kind of cut a hole in the cupboard and then just pulled all these random bricks out. So it was a very big hole on the inside um, layer of bricks behind my kitchen cupboard. And then they just put the ducting through and they were just going to leave that. So around the outside of the ducting was this bloody great big hole. And I'm like, no, 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 you can't do that because there's like a one centimetre gap behind the top of my kitchen cupboard and all that cold air from but in the cavity, cavity is just going to come up and into the house. And I had three men standing there looking at me with this blank face going, you're mad. What's wrong with you? And I went, no, 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 Oh, where's it going to come from? In the cavity. Oh, no, it won't. Anyway, so that was the conversation. Is, well, I suppose you could use um, uh, flexible foam, and uh, you know, the foam, the expandable foam. And I'm like, do you have any? No. Nah. Shall I go get some? Mm. So I sat and got this foam and came back and we just, I mean, they, they thought I was crazy, but I was like, oh my God, this is the first cap off the rank in what I'm doing. Everyone else was fabulous. Just, just that. I said, more people are going to ask this of you just so you're aware. And then I told my friend about it. She went, yeah, my sister gets this whole like wind when she gets a southerly through her cupboard from, <laughs> I was like, well, there you go. Anyway, so that was my fun experience. So get tradies that get it, right? Even if they've never done it before, as long as they get it and they'll do what you want, do that. Um, and then what I said before, think about the order that you do things so that you don't damage or undo things that you've done previously. Um, and remember that there is no rush, you know, replace things as they die. That's probably the most, um, that's the best for the planet, really. I think a lot of my things were at the end of their life, so I felt it was a good time to do it. And do it bit by bit as you can afford it. Sorry to rant. <laughs> um, all right, so this is my bragging moment. I'm taking it. You're welcome. Uh, so this was my, I got Mel back because I was like, right, I'm not living with 2.9 stars. I'm getting her back. She's coming to reassess the house. I had no idea it would be 10 stars, but it was 10 stars. And I was like, yes, <sighs> result. So yes, we went from 2.9 stars to a 10 star efficiency house. Hell yes, we did. Taking it. So how is the house performing now? Well, as you can see, uh, <clears throat> a little better. So this time last year, June, June last year, because I can't, I don't have July's bill yet, but June last year we were using 41.4 kilowatt hours per day. And now we're using 11.6 kilowatt hours per day. So we're essentially a quarter of what we were using before. But remember, we've now added hot water, cooking, and heating. And we're still using a quarter of what we were using before. That is like bonkers. So in summer, I think we were probably using about 11, 12 kilowatt hours a day. And now we're using three and a half to four and a half. And we've gone, as we said, from winter from over 40 to 10, 11. It's just still blows my mind. So what are the benefits of electrification and retrofit? No gas bill. Um, our gas bill was about $850 a year, and that's before prices rose 26%. So we would be paying now well over $1,000 a year in our gas bill, no question. Um, we are using a quarter of the electricity. We are using a quarter of the electricity we used to, but we've added hot water, cooking, and heating. So in winter, our electricity bill was about $330 a month. So again, factoring in the fact that 
bills have gone up as much as they had, we'd easily be spending well over four hundred dollars a month now in winter. So pretty extraordinary savings. Um, so now we roughly pay, and this is we've actually bumped up our solar in summer since this. So it could be either the same or maybe slightly less. We pay approximately thirty dollars over summer, one hundred and twenty five dollars a month in winter and about $50 a month in spring and autumn. But I think bumping up, as I said, it'll either be the same or less than that now. We also have noticed that the air quality is noticeably better in the house. Now, this was a real surprise. I did not expect this because the only thing at that time of year that we were using was the gas stove. The gas heater was not being used, obviously. So we were quite shocked, actually, because you'd always have sort of a, you know, my right nostril will always be blocked and it was a bit like that. No, oh, no, completely like could breathe so much better. So that gas stove was leaking into the house and we had no idea. So we were quite shocked by the difference in the air quality in the house. Um, and one of the other surprises is that the house hasn't dropped all winter, hasn't dropped below 15 degrees. So previously the house would pretty much be the same, maybe one or two degrees warmer than outside. There would not be a big difference in temperature between inside and outside in this house. And even on days where it feels like two degrees, which we've had a few of, the house has not dropped below 15 degrees. That's very happy with how that's performing, actually. All right, tricks. <clears throat> so if you're gonna close up all your gaps, gaps and cracks, um, purge the house, I call it the great purge. Um, just you know, open up your doors and windows for 20 minutes and close them up again. We've actually not been doing that a great deal over this last few weeks, but um, just, yeah, just give the house a bit of an air out. Tickety-boo. Um, get a CO2 monitor or a hygrometer. So a hygrometer is something that measures, they're just like a little thing you can buy on the interwebs. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Um, measures the humidity in the house and the temperature. So I actually bought a little pack of those and put them in all the rooms so I can kind of see, oh, the humidity is high. You know, it's just a good way of, of monitoring the house. Um, <clears throat> and I, I put a CO2 monitor in the lounge room because obviously we have closed up all those gaps and cracks. Um, and that's where we're spending a long period of time in the lounge room at night watching the TV kind of thing. So if you have those fan lights, you know, those windows above your doors, I've actually found leaving that open a bit. It's actually, we haven't had any issue with poor air quality readings or anything like that. Also sleep with your door slightly open. We do that as well, which is great. And um, just trust the insulation. So this was a big thing. So normally you'd be like blast, blast, blast the house. You have to blast it the whole time. But what I've noticed now is that when you turn the air con off, the room stays warm for hours, like hours and hours and hours. It just stays, like it might drop a couple of degrees, but actually stays warm, which, you know, we weren't used to. So you have to kind of relearn the house in a way and how things work. Um, and close your window coverings at night. That's a big one because obviously that's a big hole and the warm air will go out there and the cold air will come in. So close those curtains. Uh, and also um, use the energy you produce. So all those with that solar, if you have it, run the appliances during the day. So I am psycho lady and I'm like, right, the sun's out. Let's just put the dishwasher on. Let's do the washing. Let's put our heat pump dryer on. Let's, you know, just, I love, I feel like I'm cheating the system. It's awesome. Um, just run everything you can during the day and because you're paying nothing for that um, kilowatt hour, whereas you're paying something for it and probably a lot for it. And your feed in is only like, ours is 13 cents. But you know, what you're getting for it, if you send it to the grid is nothing like if you just use it right then and there. So you really make use of that solar during the day. And also a really big thing is to understand your electricity bill. Like what is a kilowatt hour and what tariff are you on? So I'll explain that afterwards. And, and you know, learn what is your smart meter learn about your solar app and 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 just learn to analyze those things so you can make the most out of it <clears throat> so monitoring things um on the left hand side there that's our natatmo smart indoor air quality meter so that measures co2 noise levels um temperature and humidity so we just have one of those in the lounge room and that middle photo is actually the little home coach app on your phone so you can that comes with that you can monitor everything so it's pretty cool and then if you don't want to go to that 
extent you can get these little um, or something like them hygrometers or hygrometers I'm not sure how to pronounce it uh, which again measures the humidity which is on the bottom there and the temperature on top those are brilliant so then you get some weather apps and you learn okay well what's the weather doing outside right now is it only 61 percent humidity outside but the house is you know 80 percent I should open some windows and then everything just drops inside the house in terms of the humidity so you know and then you also get a uv app like this and you can go okay when's this is winter so it's not super high but you can kind of see even if it's cloudy but the uv is high you'll get great solar which i did not know until i got solar um and it just means you can kind of sort of plan ahead in terms of using everything and just keeping the house as it should be so yeah highly recommend getting a detailed weather app with humidity levels and also get uh, a uv app so also um learn to understand your solar app and understand your electricity app if you have one so that left hand one is our solar which we called event horizon um, so for example you can see that at that particular moment the house was producing 1.968 kilowatts so great time to run stuff um, in the middle there it's kind of showing you know that's what the solar is producing the house is actually using 1368 watts so the heat pump was on at that time so the heat pump uses about a thousand watts when it's on just runs for a couple of hours um you know two kilowatt hours a day nothing and um we were sending 600 watts to the grid so you kind of learn to kind of read these things we'd used 88 percent of the solar that we had produced at that time of the day and then we were on half and half were grid power and solar power but that would grow because i think that was around midday so um yeah that would be that's kind of so you just got to learn to kind of read these things and understand them and then again with your in a daily energy usage um you can see there 10.86 kilowatt hours is what we had used the day before and it's got insights and your solar usage and just really learn to kind of analyze that learn to understand your usage is what i'm saying so um you know on your bills how it says one person uses 10 kilowatt hours, two people uses 17 kilowatt hours. Just reminding you that we were a household of two people and we we're using 41.4 kilowatt hours. So that's not even, that's more than five people. So <clears throat> you realize how much power we're using. And this bill, this energy bill would assume, most electricity bills I assume that put out these stats, they would assume you have a gas bill as well. So it's pretty extraordinary. So we're using just over what one person would use and we don't have a gas bill. So um, yeah, learn to kind of understand that. And I will just explain this thing because I've never learned about it until we did all this. What is a kilowatt hour? <laughs> because that is how they measure it on your bill. I'm just going to read this to you now. A kilowatt hour, KWH, is a measure of how how much energy you're using per hour whilst a kilowatt is a measure of power so one kilowatt hour equals 1000 watts your electricity provider charges by how much electricity you use per kilowatt hour so if i turned on an air conditioner and it was using a thousand watts and i ran it for one hour that's one kilowatt hour if i ran two a smaller air conditioners that were 500 watts each that would be one kilowatt hour etc so that's how the energy company measures and and you know but we get our bills and we're like eh, i don't understand it so that's how i was so once i understood that i was like okay and once i was able to kind of see what the usage in the house was with our smart meter with the solar you turn things on and you're like so we turned the ducted air on it was using five and a half thousand kilowatt like watts so if you have that on the ducted air on for one hour it would be five and a half kilowatt hours which is just you realize how it grew <laughs> our bill to exponential amounts so it's really important to learn how all that works on your bill and finally retrofit conclusion so this retrofit is the best thing i've spent my money on except of course for my e-bike you can ask me about that i also know lots about electric cars um but my e-bike is just the greatest thing ever invented it's a cult come and join it um the house is far more comfortable to live in so we've lived in this house for 13 years now um and it's like a different house to live in just comfort wise it's so nice 
we've future proofed the house for the next 115 years and for future owners. So I just feel good about that. Um, and we've future proofed ourselves against bill shock and reduced our electricity bills. So hopefully no more big surprises. And hopefully at some point we'll be able to afford a battery and an electric car eventually. And if you're on the fence, seriously, well, I mean, if you're here tonight, if really if you're on the fence, just do it. It is so awesome. And we are so thrilled with the results. This is very true. And the house stays warm for hours. So yes, go us. And that is the end of my presentation. <laughs> Um, we're voice. going to go through some questions. Um, we'll start with the people in the room. For anybody who's online, if we've missed questions by the time we finish, uh, we will then get back to you on those questions. So Natas is more for new homes or large renovations. But if you're trying to do an energy efficiency retrofit, you don't trigger any of that sort of Natas having to get involved. So scorecards are a really good way for anybody to get an idea on where they're sitting. You, the, you, there's no commitment that you have to then go and do all the things that we recommend at all. Um, it's just a really good way to get somebody in your home to see your situation rather than yeah, having to sort of delve through all of that research. But Sarah, I think, I, you think, have... I, think I think you can only see me on camera right now. That's so, all right. You're but heaps better looking than me anyway. So. That's not true. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for me? <laughs> Can't hear questions. Jane. Are there any issues with underfloor insulation making it difficult to do termite inspections? <laughs> we have, can I answer that? Can you hear us, Sarah? I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. We've we've got a question from the floor for you. Mm -hmm. Could you repeat that, Mel? Um, did you consider doing a blower door test at all? Um, yes, but I didn't. I didn't. I couldn't quite find that. To be honest, I, I just sort of looked up energy assessor and. I found Mel, so I just went with that. I, I sort of had read a little bit about that, but I just thought I thought the thermal camera would probably be enough, and it, I mean, it has turned out to be fine. When you're in Sarah's house, since she's had all the work done, because one thing, like the, the blow-in insulation is really good, but because she's done the hard yards and sealed up all that, the draft proofing's amazing. So we were there, there was a plane flying overhead, you couldn't even hit, we opened the door, amazing the difference. So I think that now, if she, like, exactly like you said, you, in an older house, you might be a bit nervous to get, paying for the blower door test, they might not get it to pressure mm. because they're so leaky. But now certainly Sarah could do that, but I don't think she needs to because she just being, you know, when you're in the space, it's amazing. And that, the, the, that's something we didn't talk about was the acoustics it's so much quieter in there and just beautiful relaxing planes flying overhead cars going by just nice yep so the tent that it exists at the present time yep. is that in that or with the solar thing with so with. that's with the highest you can get if you don't count solar, is eight. So that's just based on the shell uh, and the appliances. So potentially a person could just go and whack on a whole heap of solar and then potentially hit that 10 stars. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, Sarah, on the other hand, didn't, and she added all that insulation. She cleaned up the thermal shell, added the draft proofing, insulation underneath. Um, we didn't do the walls. She's got no. um, cavity brick walls, uh, not so easy to do. And I, personally, that would be one recommendation also is wait and see on some things because Sarah's already at a point that it's amazing. She didn't need to go to that extra, do the walls as well. Um, if you'd like to know, yeah, the house is actually without solar. I don't think I've looked at this. Now, this is really annoying me. <laughs> Without solar, it's 6.4 stars. 
which for a 115 year old house, amazing. So she covered all the bases. And I'm going to repeat your question so Sarah can hear it as well. Okay. What with all the draft proofing, what's the air quality like now? It's the, the air quality in the house is much, much better because the gas is out of the house now. So as I said, that's made a massive difference. It, it can get a little bit stuffy. So as I said, that's why you kind of purge the house, but you don't like in, because the, the gas is out of the house, like I would actually say it's better, even if it's a little bit stuffy. I mean, in summer, we have all our doors and windows open all the time. That 20 minute open things up, just you're good to go for the rest of the day. Does that make sense? And Sarah also, like she showed you, she put in that monitoring just to be certain so that she knows everything's okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, that that main monitor that you've got checks on VOCs as well, doesn't it, Sarah? The CO2 monitor? The, I thought that, the, you. anyway, sorry, I don't know. that The, the, the monitor that you've got, the... The yeah. one that's in the lounge room. Yep. That's Does it sick. check on VOCs as well? Do you know? No, no. You've got to remember too that the gas that she's taken out of the house introduces a lot of moisture into the house. So a lot of people assume that, you know, it's because you've tightened everything up. But if, you're, you, if you've got gas and you're not exhausting properly in the house, then you've got added moisture as well. Sarah doesn't have any mold problems at the moment, and I'm sure she's going to keep a really good eye on that. That that's the type of person that she is. At the moment, Sarah's works from home, so she's sort of. A, a, I heard a great term the other day. She's sailing the house. So, <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry. Um. Um. Yes. So. Uh, from the audience, they want to know um, whether Sarah has looked at putting in an HRV, is that what you're referring to, or some sort of <clears throat> mechanical ventilation system? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have thought about it, and that's part of that reason was getting the CO2 monitor. Um, I think because the house is double brick and they're quite large. I was like, oh, I'm just going to monitor the house for a while and just actually see how we go because that's a quite a big thing to do. And ever since we opened the fan lights in the rooms, it's fine. So I haven't at all thought that that was necessary because of those, the windows above the doors. Because we were getting after like maybe, I don't know, you're in the lounge room for about four or five hours watching TV and then you get a poor air quality and then you'd have to open the door. But with that fan light open, like maybe just that much, it's fine. So I probably won't, to be honest. I feel like it's a test with the house. I have to do like a year, a good year of sort of monitoring the house through the seasons and then then I feel like we'll kind of know. But I, at this point, I'm sort of, I was kind of like, oh, maybe I do need to do that. Now I think probably not. In a double cavity brick house, do is it okay to close the vents? Yes. Now, <laughs> it, it's important to understand that we didn't close the vents on the outside, right? And I wouldn't recommend you close the vents on the outside. So you close the vents on the inside to stop that heat transfer, but you're leaving that one on the outside so that air is still circulating in that cavity on the from the outside vent. Yeah, can I, I wouldn't recommend doing that. Can I just uh, mention one extra thing about those vents? We think that they're there to stop mold in the house. They're actually not there for that. They will put in because when people had gas lanterns on their walls in their houses back in the olden days of the late 1800s, early 1900s, the gas was actually so toxic. There's the articles about, sorry to laugh, there's articles of people actually dropping dead in their houses because it was so bad. And so they put those in so people wouldn't die. And actually they create mold quite often. I think, I think I was reading in the My Efficient Electric Home that they don't serve the purpose that we think we do. And we haven't had any mold since we've closed everything up. The house has been great. Like it's performing much better. So they weren't really there for the purpose of making houses breathe and stopping mold. I, I don't think that's true at all because yeah, no mold. First question is what type of ins insulation did you put in the ceiling? It looked like polyester to me. No, it's blow-in in the ceiling. 
Mm. Are you talking about underfloor insulation or in the roof? Yeah, I've got some here if anyone wants to come and have a little look as well. Yeah. And I'm coming back. It would be my, like most people would use bats, polyesters. It does seem to be the, that's what's under our house, the underfloor insulation. Mm -hmm. But we already had blow-in in the roof, so I just wanted to top it up. That's why we just continued with the blow-in. And, and the blow-in adds the acoustic element. It really deadens the sound. So because there are currently aeroplanes flying over, that really absorbs that really, really well. And, and a lot of people in my efficient electric home put a layer of bats between the joists, but then they do like a cross over the top of the actual joist again with a second layer because you're not, cut, you know, you've got this sort of, well, Mel would know, you know, you've got all these gaps when you put the thermal camera up there where the wood is. So the insulation isn't covering that. With the blow-in, you can cover all that. So you've got that extra layer of insulation. There's quite a few questions about um, the actual process of, of getting rid of the meter, dealing with Gemini. Um, <laughs> one question about um, could a plumber cap it off and a person asked if they could take the meter. Well, to this um, was what I there did. Is cost, there is a cost attached. So if so, we talk about that. Process. Yes. So the, um, the plumber who was there to install the hot water heat pump, he capped the meter for me and actually removed the meter for me. Um, this isn't necessarily what everyone should do, but this is what I did, is that I actually took the meter then out to Old Guildford to the Gemina um, place, meter place, and gave it to them. And I had to show them the certificate that was given to me by the plumber, which was very important to have that to go. And he has to put his license number on there and his name. And so I handed that in and it's, Look, between you and I, it is kind of che like cheating the system because Gemini, it was like computer says no. They couldn't cope. Like the meter reader came round and there was no meter. So he left a very confused note saying, can you please call me? And so I had taken a photo of the final reading of the meter. So I was able to send that to him. So that was that was done. I thought, okay, well, that's the end of that. And I had called already Gemini to say, oh, look, I want to get rid of gas, which I don't think exists in their system. Um, it's either you're moving house or you're changing providers or you're renovating. That's kind of the only options available. Um, and so about three weeks later, a guy came around and scratching his head and I was home. So I saw him and he was like, where's your meter? And it was capped and he could see that. And he went, oh, okay, uh, I'll be back. Then the next guy came and he was a guy a few rungs up on the ladder and he was like, oh, right. Okay. Well, you can't leave that alive line like that hmm, okay, no, because it's live from the street, even though it's capped, that's not safe, blah, blah, blah. And then about another three weeks later, this team of people turn up with no, like, not, <laughs> we didn't even know they were coming. They dug up the road, they disconnected it, and then they left, and it didn't cost me anything. I think they do try to charge you about a thousand bucks, but because I had returned the meter, I don't think the system could cope. I don't know whether that leap, that, that loophole will close up, but that's what happened, my end. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that you can do is you can get your gas meter plugged, which means it isn't removed, but the, it, it stops the supply and you're no longer billed. Mm. And it remains there if someone in the future wants to reconnect, not that you would want to. <laughs> I liked, I want to make it as difficult as possible for someone to reconnect. But mm. if you do that, you will then start getting letters from your energy provider saying to the householder you must pay blah 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 otherwise your gas will be disconnected and basically people in the my efficient electric home just say ignore it and eventually they they're just well, computer that, generated <laughs> that that occurs in other states but not in new south wales oh we got if a letter want... we, we got a letter to the householder even after but we've if... been through everything else okay well yeah Anyway, I did it and it, co it costs $120, so it's not expensive. Oh. There's a question here. May we close the vents if we have fluid wood fire? Mm. I wouldn't recommend that. I'm not an expert in that, but I, I, I think that you need some, yeah, if you're burning anything inside your house, even though it's fluid, I, I, I don't think that you want to go down that path. The no. Probably most efficient way is to have a flue close to the fire or a vent in the 
close to the fire so it's not pulling cold air from us. Yes. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, maybe keep them for that one room. Uh, one last question. What would you recommend to reduce sagging of underfloor insulation, especially in an exposed windy area? Mm. Are the polyweave straps the best? Yes, I, I think we'd, uh, I was hoping our insulation guys could be here, but I, I can probably come back to you and ask, ask the insulation guys that question. Um, Oh, we get, we've got an answer from the, from the audience and they're saying, hang on, I'll just race over. <laughs> and you normally put a cross trap, um, uh, like an X across the joist and that stops the, the sagging. There you go. Did you, I hope, hopefully you heard that from the online questions. Is there any other onlines or should we ask here? Okay, we might, anybody else got any other questions? Oh, yep. Oh, hang on. This, I've had one from you before. I think I'll see this fellow. Hello, firstly, Sarah, while I've got a microphone that I know you can hear, what microphone are you using? I'm using a Rode NT1. NT1, thank you. Made um, right here in you... Sydney and Silverwater. God. No, and hi, <laughs> you've solved a problem that um, I know my wife is going to be watching when she's, she's in Queensland at the moment. She's going to be saying, ah, that's what you want to do in your studio. So maybe I'd like to know what you did for insulation there. But the, the question about insulation for the floor, we've got a house where um, a it was originally one story, another story of effectively rooms were put underneath. Ah. And and so there's there's a... Uh, there's mm. a floor that has been created between a ceiling and the floor above. Sorry, there's a gap. There's, there's a gap between the ceiling of the downstairs area and the floor upstairs, which appears never to have been insulated. Mm. And they didn't insulate underneath the floor when they built the lower section. Mm. So I can see what we might do now to insulate underneath, which is put the polyester stuff in. Um, but what do you do in the middle? Be so is it conditioned in like <laughs> this is a male question <laughs> sorry is it a what's in under it so if it's a conditioned space in under there's plenty of houses these days that don't get insulated between the two floors maybe for um soundproofing but it, it's essentially sort of the one envelope then so less important because it's not an external floor okay. so prioritize the one that you're saying you can potentially get access to the external one yeah, down, no, down, sure. yeah i think it isn't i think at the moment we've got about 250 mils but you know in the joists yep and there is a sound isolation problem between downstairs and upstairs right and yep and there is a heat movement challenge because so depending on the wiring that's in there it'd be worth contacting the an insulation company to see if they can do some pump in. They they, they can blow in and do the the blow in or just blow in. yeah <laughs> or um there's like these little um I'll show you these <laughs> where are they this insert block that might be a possibility. Oh sorry, no, you're right. um just depending on your electricals, you've got to be careful that you're not sealing up and causing a problem if there's electricals running through that floor at all so there's a few things you've got to check before you just go and fill it um there's also some other products stuff. yes yeah. that that's the um wool cell um that's what's in sarah's sarah's um seal like above her ceiling um, yeah, so make sure you do your homework on those things. There's, there are some other products. I'll talk to you a little bit after a particular product you might be able to use. It's, it's yeah. Okay, sorry. There was um, there were there. I just there was one question here from John, and he asked about uh, underfloor insulation making it difficult to do termite inspections. Doesn't make it difficult at all because they're going between those joists, so you can still see all the woodwork. You just can't see the actual floor underneath of the floorboards. But my termite guy just came and didn't underfloor inspection literally on Monday and no problem whatsoever. It becomes a problem if there's spray foam because they physically cannot access the timber. In your ceilings case, I imagine your termite person's going to have to move the insulation to be able to actually look at the timbers. Um, but at least because it's soft, you can probably move it back afterwards, but you're going to have to check that. So that's a dilemma now. Spray foam would be really good to seal it properly, but then you have the problem of termite inspections. He's able yes, to... Sir. He's able to see 
because he can go all the way under the house now, because actually access under the house with that ducting was a problem, he's able to see those little termite tunnels where they started underneath and he's been able to interrupt those now and we've had that issue. So he knows where in the roof they were. Um, so I think the underneath is probably the most important thing that he can see that, but he has, we, that's why I put in those little goat paths so he can get around. Yes. He, if he needs to move anything, he can, and he can of course still see all the, the rafters. So. Hi, my question relates to your roof, which I noticed in all the photographs, um, that you've got no sarking, I no sarking. believe. Mm -hmm. So you've got no sarking. So my question relates to, cause I'm looking at, into this right now for our roof, um, because we're not sarked either, um, and we've got scattered insulation that's not working, to, to really look at the measurement between if the roof had been sarked in addition to the level of insulation. And the way I understood when you described your insulation, you had ex pre-existing bulk insulation but not throughout, and then you did that blow in on top. So I'm really trying to find how you measure the difference between the the quantity of or type of bulk insulation or equivalent to if the roof is sucked or not sucked because that 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 measurement is somewhat false in a way because you've double bulk you double insulated and that's what I'm trying to work out and secondly which is something I'm looking into right now whether you can retro suck or how you can suck if there is no sucking and you don't want to take off your tiles you need to join my efficient electric home <laughs> because that's Dora, I've taken lots of notes. <laughs> Definitely notes. a question that's asked a lot. <laughs> but, but Sarah did have blow-in before. It mm. wasn't. Was it blow-in? It yeah. looked like it was some bulk. No, no, no. no. It, was, it wasn't bulk. There was, was some bulk over where the bathroom was. In the corner. That was blow-in, a, a smaller amount of blow-in. And then. It was, it was all blow-in. And then there was a tiny bit of uh, bats in that corner because we had actually removed that roof. Where the photograph looked, it did look like it was cut in between. So yeah, in principle, if you, in principle, if you want to build say a room or an attic room or a storage room, the blow-in is not in my mind, the way to do it because how no. are you going to build your floor? So if you're going to use bulk insulation, I'm looking at comparatively how you can compare your sarking, your bulk insulation, like, your figure of that 10 for the house somewhat confuses me on that because she has no sarking. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for so much contributing all your experience and, and it's been very useful. And thanks to Mel for all her insights. We also encourage you to go to our Facebook page and our local branch has a YouTube channel page and you'll see um, videos of our past meetings if you haven't seen them and you can download them there. Anyway, um, thanks a lot for coming and that's a sign off from, from us.